What's up, guys? How you doing? We may buffer one time because that's what happened yesterday, and then it'll be smooth. How you guys doing? Everyone good? Yeah, someone was complaining. Isaac Marshall, I think it, he was a guy. Oh, you like T-shirts. Well, what do you want me to like? So I said, okay, I'll just wear something different now. Okay. All right. I just want to give a shout out to all the people on Discord. You know who you are. I just want to say yay, yay. And if you guys at Discord want to show up here on the channel as well, so you can just, you know, bring up my numbers so I can compete with Hater Wood. That's up to you guys, man. I can't make you do what you don't want to do. So I just want to say hi to the folks at the Discord. The Discord's in the hizzy. What's up, Dinu? I was just reading a post. We're going to wait a few more minutes. We'll begin in prayer. I ask the Lord Jesus to show up and to fill us with the Holy Spirit to glorify the name of Jesus Christ and give me the health I need to do this. I was just reading a post by Marie Wood. What happened, Sai? What's the Sai for, Andrew? Why are you always a harbinger of bad news, man? All right, Goofy. Andrew Martin. Namaste. You go, Sai. I was reading a post by Marie Wood. Well, the thing is, I don't, I don't plan to do my live streams at the same time that other brothers and sisters are doing it. But what do you want me to do? Okay, here, let me shut down, guys. Guys, I'm going to shut down, and I'll be back at midnight, okay? Take care, guys. Is that what you want me to do? What's wrong with you? Okay. Well, you guys, if you want to talk about Islam, if you guys want to talk about Islam, you can go there. I'm not competing with my brothers, sisters, and the Lord Jesus Christ. No, but I, you know, I, I don't know when he's going to live stream. I have to live stream when I can because don't forget, I have mods that have families and have commitments, and they're serving me to serve you without getting paid. They don't get paid for this. They're not in full time ministry, so they take time off from the limited time they have because they have to work jobs, take care of family. So Protestant and First Lance and other mods, they're not in full-time ministry. They don't get paid for doing this. They sacrifice their own time to do this as a labor of love for Jesus Christ, serving me to serve you. So I have to be sensitive to their time, right? And I plead the blood of Jesus Christ to be our covering, the blood of Jesus Christ to be our shield and our protection against any disease and virus, and the wall of fire from the Holy Spirit guarding us and shielding us in Jesus' almighty name. Because this is what I was going to talk about. If there were one stream by one, there would be less overall view. I have no idea what that means, Isaac. Marie Wood was just commenting that she actually went to the store and found there was no toilet paper. Man, I didn't know it's this bad. The panic about the coronavirus. Some are saying it's much worse than the media lets on, but... Seriously? And that she tried to get Charmin on Amazon.com and they're out of stock till the end of the month. Seriously, I'm, I'm blown away. What does, what does toilet paper got to do with the coronavirus? I know they say take a lot of vitamin C, keep washing your hands, and it spreads fast and it goes undetected because you can have it before the symptoms show up. But, uh, man, I'm behind the times. You know, I'm not saying don't be cautious. Be wise as serpents, innocent as doves. And I truly beseech and beg Jesus Christ, my Lord, that he will have mercy on us. In my case, more so on my daughters, that in Jesus' name, they are covered by the blood of Jesus, sealed by the Spirit. No harm comes to them that I die before anything happens to them. I'm more worried about them than I am of me, you know. Right? And I don't, but I still don't get... What does toilet paper got to do? I, I seriously don't know. I mean, is there a connection with toilet paper preventing coronavirus? I know it's silly to talk about, but when even David Wood's wife mentions it, that she couldn't find any toilet paper and that she had to go to Amazon and order, and Amazon's out of stock till the end of the month. <laughs> What's going on, man? I mean, I'm, I'm really baffled. And because of the coronavirus scare, 
I'm a little panicked, so please, guys, pray for my daughters. Tomorrow, my oldest turns 10. But I keep calling them, and I haven't heard from them. And just again, I, you're a family, and I ask your prayers in Jesus' name for true conviction and repentance for their mother to fear Jesus and repent and get right with Jesus Christ, because that way we can work together to raise them. I'm hoping nothing serious, which they're not responding, right? Uh, but at the same time, I'm wondering if their mother has taken the phone to try to punish me. I don't know. And I only share this because I need your prayers. God Almighty is in control. He's the Almighty God. And Jesus Christ will open doors that no man can shut and shut doors that no man can open. So I don't know why my daughters haven't responded. Is it because their mother has taken the phone to punish me? Well, the Lord Jesus deal with her and chasten her in love to repent if that's the case. But it doesn't help with the coronavirus scare, you know, when you have two girls. So please pray. So anyway, you're saying that you're saying that that, that the coronavirus causes diarrhea. That's what it does. So, okay, someone said no, someone said yes. See, the, the media has confused everyone. Viral pneumonia. Oh, wow. Okay, I don't know. I may have the symptoms, man. If that's so, may God have mercy. If you want to take me home, this will be done. Yes, actually, wiser, greener. The one that preached with me on the streets of Chicago is the guy who led me to the Lord Jesus Christ. So you confirmed part of my testimony, wiser, greener. How did you meet him? The one that you spoke to was the one who led me to Jesus Christ. Guys, did you read what wiser, greener just posted? He met the young man whom the Lord Jesus used to lead me to Jesus Christ when I was around six and a half years old. And his grandmother taught us the faith, and we used to do street evangelism. He's nine. He was nine at the time, and I was six and a half, turning seven. And he's the one that God used in my life. I'm shocked, Wiser Greener, that you ran into him. And how did he know that you know me? How did you speak with him on the phone? How do you, got, how do you know him? But how did I come up? That's my question. That's, like, shocking. And if it's the person... So he told you that we used to do street evangelism when we were young. So it can only be the man who led me to the Lord. Unless it's somebody else when it's on about later in life when I became, you know, 20. So I'm going to put, you know, because it's part of my testimony, so I'm not put it out there. The man that led me to the Lord when I was around six and a half years old, turning seven. Right. He was nine years old. His name was Raymond Malco. Is that the brother you met? Is that the one? He was nine years old. His grandmother was a godly woman who would teach us how to worship Jesus Christ. That's him, Wiser Greener. That's the man. So, guys, you see the name Wiser Greener? He spoke with the man who led me to saving faith. In Jesus Christ when I was around six and a half years old turning seven and he was nine years old so he met the man who led me to Jesus Christ see here it is a witness confirmation that I don't make stuff up right that when I ch tell you I try to be as honest and as accurate as possible although I'm sure I get some details mixed up so why is there green you guys listen to what he said so this man, Raymond, my brother in the Lord, gave a great testimony of me. Wow. Yeah, I'm still in contact with him. I mean, I haven't spoken to him in a while. But wow, I'm just curious, Wiser. You said through work? Wow. And how, But how did I come? That's what I'm saying. Even though through work you met him, what, how did he know that you know me? All right? Just curious, guys. I'm just waiting, guys. This is our routine. We wait a few more minutes and we begin. So I told you it's going to buffer. But in Jesus' name, may he elim eliminate all buffering, right? We wait a few more minutes, three minutes for the regular show up, then we begin. But I'm curious, how did, you know, did he know that you knew me or that you're, you know, drinking coffee here? Guys, just please pray extra hard for my daughters. 
that Jesus Christ will just miraculously protect and provide for them and that I hear from them because my oldest turns 10 tomorrow, but I haven't heard from them. Pray they're safe because now I'm burdened because of the coronavirus. I'm thinking of them, not me, but them. The topic, Kel Kelpish Bumia, is why does Kelpish Bumia not read the title? That's going to be the topic, right? For what? What court case? Is why does Kelpish Bumia not read the title? That's going to be the topic, right? For what? What court case? Smoke and mushrooms or something? Okay, in Jesus' name. As long as they're safe. I want to die before anything happens to them. Yeah, so anyway, let's ask the Lord to bless and to energize us and refresh us and replenish us and rejuvenate us. It's my habit to always invoke our God. Ortho Christos, welcome, brother. It's my habit to always begin in prayer because we don't, at least me, I don't want to, you know, I don't pray enough. I don't worship God enough. I don't thank him enough. I don't love him enough. I don't study his word enough. I don't do his commands and obey his commands as much as I should. And may God have mercy on me, a pitiful worm, and this is the truth. And may he have patience with me and all of us and forgive us. And by the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ, may we be washed and purified and cleansed and transformed by the power and the life of the Holy Spirit to truly love God and obey God and serve God and worship God and adore God and proclaim his word Live for him and die for him because we love you, Father. We love you imperfectly, Lord, but you know our condition better than we know <clears throat> ourselves. And we trust in your mercy, Father. We trust in your compassion, Father. We trust in your love and your patience and your, your pity for us, Father. And we trust in Jesus Christ. He is your heart that became flesh. He is your beloved that became flesh. Your beloved son, the Lord Jesus. And we plead the blood of his cross. It's the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the life that he offered on Calvary's cross, his sacrifice that appeases you and removes your anger and displeasure from us who trust in your son, who hope in your son, and who desire to love your son. And Father, we ask, give us the power to love your son, the Lord Jesus, to be in love with your son and to obey him as proof that we love him. Help us, Lord, not just to be lip service. And we trust in your Holy Spirit, and we love your Holy Spirit, and we're in love with your Holy Spirit, and help us to perfectly love your Spirit. Holy Spirit, we ask that you give us power to love you the way you deserve to be loved, to love the Father and the Son the way they deserve to be loved. Because with the Father and the Son, you, Holy Spirit, our God, you are Jehovah. And you guide us, you preserve us, you protect us, you transform us. You teach us. You love us. You even discipline and correct us when need be. So Holy Spirit, we, we entrust ourselves to you. I entrust my children to you. Holy Spirit of life, preserve them, preserve us. And Holy Spirit, take over this session. Fill my lungs and my chest and throat with the life from your presence, with the breath of life. And anoint my mouth to speak clearly without error. Please save me from error, even minor error. And give us power to then live the word of God, to love the word of God, to proclaim the word of God. And not to be ashamed of the word of God and to be transformed by the word of God and even to die for the word of God. The word of God, which is the Bible, the voice of God to us. Bless them, Holy Spirit, to understand these issues. And give me grace to be patient with them as you are patient with me. Please, I have so many imperfections. Do not let me be a stumbling block to them. And Holy Spirit, illuminate them as only you can. Give them eyes to see and ears to hear. And please, Holy Spirit, use this channel. Use my articles. Use my life to bring glory to Jesus Christ and bring more people. The right people with the right attitude who will not cause me to stumble and I won't cause them to stumble. Save us from the evil one. Please, Holy Spirit, please. Again, we say we love you, Abba. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Have your way in Jesus' name. Yeah, we'll go for Abba. Yes, sir, we had a good-sized crowd. We got about 190. Hopefully, it'll keep increasing, not decreasing. Anger, flame, pitching, crucible, my flesh, please, my God. Guys, it's buffering a little bit, but that's okay. In Jesus' name, the buffering will stop. We're connected. We're connected to the modem. So pray that the buffering goes away. It is 99% better than it used to be, and it stays better in Jesus' name. Please, please, Lord, 
plus the internet connection. That's even grace from you. By the way, you see Wiser Green, guys? I want you to go back and scroll. He met. Let me say it again. You guys were not pay paying attention. Thank you, Wiser Green, for being here. And Wiser Green, as you can see, sometimes I can be harsh and in your face and go for the juggler. If you can put up with that by the grace of God, I trust you will learn and be blessed by the Spirit. But Wiser Green met, and this is blessing me, he met Raymond Malco. Raymond Malco was a nine-year-old boy that preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to me when I was around six and a half years old, close to seven. That was the young boy that Jesus used to bring me to saving faith. He met him. He spoke with him. Glory to God. And Wiser Green just blessed me by telling me he gave him a positive re report about me. God bless you, RD, and God bless every one of you for your support and your prayers. The Lord Jesus reward you for that. May you be blessed in Jesus' name. So isn't it amazing? What a small world. Wiser Green is from my neck of the woods where I used to live, but I had to flee because of that corrupt satanic judge, that whore of the devil. May the Lord Jesus deal with her and protect me from her and my children from her. He met him and spoke with him. And thank you, Wiser Green. That young man, he was nine years old, who led me to Jesus, is still someone who's in my life, though I haven't spoken to him in a while because he's busy. He's married. He's got kids, three beautiful kids. May God bless them. But Wiser Green tells me that he spoke highly of me. When you speak to him, tell him, hey, you have Sam's number. Call me. Stay in contact. And Sam always praises Jesus for you, Raymond, because Jesus used you, Raymond, to lead me to Christ. And so he gets the blessing of this ministry. He gets the blessing of this ministry. Right? Ask me later on about fleeing from a country or a city or a village because of an evil, filthy, wicked judge or ruler use of the devil, that that's biblical. Now, with that said, we're going to do another session related to the Trinity because this is related to the Trinity. I'm trusting the Spirit to guide me, to protect me from error, and to accurately define terms, right? Accurately define terms because these are issues that if you're a serious student into the Bible, and I know Louisa couldn't be here. May the Lord bless her. I hope Mary and Marcy will be here because I'm really concerned about the newbies who have been coming. I want to make sure they're fed by the grace of God's Spirit using me to feed them. And they understand these issues. Okay. Here's the thing. These are terms that if you're a serious student of the Bible, and you guys are serious students of the Bible, that's why you're here. These are terms you're going to have to get familiar with. So if you love the Bible and you want to be a student of the Bible, you're going to have to learn these things because they're out there. And you will discover these issues if you're evangelizing. If you're evangelizing, if you're doing ministry, not just on social media, but if you're out there interacting with people, these issues come up, especially on social media. If you're on social media, especially on YouTube, you're going to run into men, even women, on their YouTube channels, or you're going to find a lecture or a talk that brings up these issues. So I'm trusting the Spirit to save me from error and illuminate me and through me illuminate you and bless you to know these issues and be prepared for the glory of Jesus Christ. Okay, now, Isaac, just because I didn't mention you by name, don't be sensitive, brother. It seems like you're sensitive. By the grace of God, may the Lord Jesus affirm and love you. If I didn't mention you by name, doesn't mean I'm ignoring you. I like that analogy, even though it falls short. Sorry about that. I'm drinking coffee, and I hate my coffee, brother, and I got to trim my beard. Okay, let's define some of these terms. Everyone with me? And please make sure... Keep your questions related to the topic. Don't ask me a question that goes off the topic. No side discussions. Don't get into side discussions because I want you to listen and benefit. I know other people on their channels don't mind. I mind for one reason. I'm reading your comments because the comments help me see if you're understanding or you're confused. Because as a teacher, I'm trusting the Spirit to help me to clarify things for you so you can know your faith more perfectly and live it out. For the glory of Jesus. Okay. Deal with who? See? See, I got distracted again. Anna, Panos, let's focus on Jesus. Let him deal with them. See, now I got confused. You see, this, this proved my point. 
When you guys go into tangents and side issues and you talk about other things, I'm what's going on here? Focus, for the love of Christ, focus so you can help me to help you. Okay, let's talk about henotheism versus monotheism. Here's the words I want you to write down or re-listen and re-re-listen, right? Re-listen and re-re-listen until it becomes second nature by the grace of God's spirit and you can recall this information. You know the term monotheism. And in the heading for the discussion, here, the title of the discussion, the session, you see the word henotheism. Remember these terms, henotheism. Okay. Also remember the word monolatry. Monolatry. Okay. In, in, in Western Christianity, our philosophical and theological language, terminology and words, have been influenced and shaped by Greek and Latin. A lot of our terms, you can trace their roots to the Greek language and or Latin, right? For example, henotheism actually are two Greek terms, hen or heno or heis, theos. Monolatry is also two Greek terms, monos, latreia from latruo. Here, I spelled it out for you. Henos. Theou is what we're, where we get henotheism from. Those who speak Greek, henos, theou means, right? <clears throat> of one God, of one God. Mono, monos or monos, latreia means one worship, the worship of one, right? Yes, of the one God, of one God. Manos, monos, latreia, which comes from latruo, means the worship of one. So you understand what these terms, so you understand how Greek language and Latin in the West have influenced and shaped the theology and the philosophy and the language of Western Christianity, of Western society, right? Now in the Eastern part of the world, the language that has influenced and shaped the Eastern part of Christianity, where, where you know, the Eastern part of the hemisphere, is Aramaic, Syriac, Arabic. Now, even Aramaic and Syriac <clears throat> influenced by Greek. Why? Because when the New Testament was written in Greek and then translated into Aramaic slash Syriac, because Syriac is an offshoot of Aramaic, those who spoke Syriac slash Aramaic and converted to the Christian faith were influenced by their Greek forebears. Right, so that's why you'll even find Greek words adopted into the Aramaic Syriac language. Right, Greek words that have been <clears throat> carried over into the Aramaic Syriac language. And ironically, for you students of the Quran, students of Islam, those of you who debate, those of you who debate Muslims, you'll even find the influence of Greek in the Arabic Quran. Did you know that? Because the <clears throat> Greek words that shaped the thinking and theology of the Aramaic-speaking Christians, right, also shaped and influenced Muhammad and or the authors of the Quran. Can I give you some examples? God bless you, DJ Next. May the Lord Jesus preserve you and thank you for your support. And guys, let me give a shout out to a brother here. We got Mike Mikeable. Mike Mikeable is one half of the Christian rap group Hazakim. So we got Hazakim in the hizzy. He's right there. Him and his wife, his lovely, beloved wife, are watching. Lord Jesus, bless you, Mike, and your wife, and your brother, Tony, and his wife, and your children, and preserve you for the glory of Yeshua, the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, and Yeshua, the Father, Son. So we got Hezekim in the hizzy. <laughs> Moni in the middle. Where's she at? Where's she at? Moni in the middle. In the middle. Where's she at? It's a shame the way you go with my heart. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not Christian rap or hip hop. Folks, glory to God. Keep praying for me to keep following this course. I'm losing weight. This shirt has become super big on me. And in Jesus' name, I keep losing weight and get my health back. Man, glory to God. Right? It's become like super big. I can't wear it anymore. Right? So Hazakim is in the hizzy. By the way, Hazakim is the plural of Hazak or Chazak, 
Chazak, Chazakim, Chazak, right? So I just want you to know. So now, let me give you an example for you guys who are witnessing to Muslims. And hopefully, Lord, please bring them in. Ya Adam Shikha. Let me show you how the Greek language even influenced the Quran. Are you guys ready for that? And by the way, I don't say this to say this. I love these brothers. I love my, Mike and Tony. May God prosper them and open doors of ministry that no man can shut. In the Quran, you'll find the term Injil. Injil. Yes, but kal Kalpish, I would be a stand-up comedian sitting down because I'm too old to be standing up. <laughs> All right, anyway. In the Quran, you'll find mention of the gospel of Jesus. And in the Arabic, it's called Injil. Injil actually comes from Greek through Syriac. It is a Greek word in origin that came through Syriac, Aramaic, into Arabic. Injil, because what is the Greek word for gospel? Ewan galion. Ewan galion. Ewan galion. Ewan galion. Right? So it actually comes, and by the way, thou shall not pontificate. If he's here, he can confirm this. He's a young man who loves Jesus and he's quite sharp. So I don't know if he's listening. Ewan galion. Ewan galion. So Injil is actually. From Syriac, which comes from Greek. So here you see the Arabic Quran influenced, shaped by Greek language. Why? Because the New Testament was written in Greek because that was the language of that time, the lingua franca of the world. And so because the New Testament was written in Greek and then multitudes of people became Christian, they needed to know their Greek language to understand the message of the New Testament. And many of them already knew that because that was the language you spoke when you wanted to speak to other groups and needed to read and write Greek to translate it into the various languages. So I'm sure you Greeks are happy about that, aren't you? You Greeks, right, are so excited that you gave the world philosophy, you gave the world theology, and you're sitting on your laurel saying, see, we gave you Plato and Socrates and Plotinus, and we gave you Aristotle, and we gave you even the, the New Testament Greek. Tikanis kesikala. We are some special people, Ere. Right? I'm sure you love that, you Greek guys, right? Panos Filippo. You're like, yeah, I'm, I'm bad. Yeah, we bad. Uh-huh, uh-huh, we bad. And here's something else that's interesting, a side issue. The writings of Aristotle and Socrates and Plato, Plotinus, as well as the medical works of the Greek physicians like Hippocrates, right, <clears throat> were actually translated by Aramaic-speaking Christians, some of whom included my ancestors, the Assyrians, and then taken over by the Muslims and translated into Arabic. So when they tell you, Islam influenced science, medicine, right? And spawned the European Renaissance. In reality, in reality, it was the Greek writings preserved by the Syriac, Syriac Aramaic Christians that the Muslims then <clears throat> had access to and translated to Arabic that spawned Islamic science and culture, which spawned the European Renaissance. Did you guys know that? Did you know that? It's amazing the impact and influence of the Greeks. But again, don't forget the connection, the bridge from the Greek writings, the philosophers and the doctors, the physicians, right? And the theologians and Islam, the Aramaic speaking Christians. In other words, my ancestors had a hand to play in being the bridge between Islamic science, Islamic philosophy, and Greek philosophy, science, and medicine. Because the writings of the Greeks were being translated into Syriac Aramaic by the Aramaic Syriac-speaking Christians. And when the Muslims came over, 
They found the writings in the possession of the Christians, and then they translated to Arabic, and it spawned Islamic civilization, which then spawned European civilization. You with me there? Exactly, medic for Christ. And that it's not to deny that the Greeks themselves would have been influenced by the Babylonians and those that came before them. But Aristotelian logic, Aristotle, the Muslims became steeped into, Arist into what's called Aristotelian logic. Well, where did they get access to Aristotle? The Aramaic-speaking Christians that had preserved the works of Aristotle and others in Aramaic slash Syriac. Did I bore you guys with that lesson? See, Abdul Halaj, you confirm. And by the way, thou, thou shall not pontificate. I was correct about Injil, right? Yep, you guys know this. So I'm preaching to choir. So don't let the Muslims try to pull a fast one and say, Islam spawned European Renaissance. You guys would have spawned nothing if you followed Muhammad. The reason why Islam, Islamic civilization became what it was is because of the writings of the Greek philosophers and the physicians, which the Christians, the Aramaic-speaking Christians, the Syriac-speaking Christians had preserved, studied, and translated into their language and built on. Sucker. And by the way, I don't know why I'm looking here because there's nobody in front of me. I guess I'm looking at the Muslim jinn. Though invisible to the human eye, I sense he's here. Get behind me! Anyway, Yep, the Persians as well. Okay, with that said, I went on a tangent here. Let's come back to the word. Henotheism. Okay, let's go back. Sorry, guys. Henotheism. Write these words down, memorize them. Monolatry. Now, depending the context in which these terms are applied, their definitions, right, will be affected. In other words, these terms have... Nuanced meanings depending on the context in which these terms are being applied, to what, what group you're applying these terms to. In other words, Hinduism is a form of henotheism, right? Zoroastrianism is a form of henotheism. Even Greek mythology is a form of henotheism. Mormons, right? Mormonism is a form of henotheism. So depending on the group, depending on the religion, these terms will have <clears throat> nuanced meanings, specific shades of meaning, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to limit the use of these terms in the context of the Bible and Israelite religion. So are you with me here? Before I move on, I don't want to confuse you guys. I'm trusting the Spirit to help me. To recall these facts correctly and save me from error. And then the Spirit illuminate you to understand these issues. So I'm going to use these terms in reference to the Bible. And specifically to the Israelite religion and Christianity. I'm not going to look at how these terms are used in reference to Hinduism or even Mormonism, which is not Christian. I don't care what people tell you. Mormonism is not Christian. And I'm not going to use these terms in respect to Greek myths. I'm going to use these terms in respect to the Bible, to the Israelite faith and Christianity. And that's how I'm going to define those terms in light of Christian beliefs, Israelite religion, and biblical teaching. So I'm going to limit my definition of henotheism and monolatry to the Bible specifically. And in light of the Bible, the Israelite religion and Christianity. So with that said, henotheism, what does that mean? Henotheism. What the, what's the basic meaning of henotheism? Now, again, the Greek word hen, hen means one. Okay. So I'm going to define the term in respect to the Bible and also how this term is used in refer reference to the history of Israel and how the term is used right now by Christians who are henotheists. So henotheism means one God. Now, someone who's sharp and thinking will say, doesn't monotheism also mean one God? Monos, that's a Greek word for only one. Theos, right? Doesn't that also mean one God? So what's the difference between henotheism and monotheism? 
Well, monotheism typically is understood to mean, pay attention now, monotheism typically is defined and understood to mean only one God and there is none else. There is no other God besides the one true God. That's how monotheism is typically understood. Henotheism says, in respect to Christianity and what these people believe the Bible teaches, there is one true, eternal, almighty God. And there is no other God like the one true God in the sense that there's only one God that's uncreated, one God that's timeless, one God that is almighty, one God that is all-knowing, one God that is ever-present. And yet, though there's only one God in that sense, there's only one God in that sense, there are other gods created that are limited, finite, temporal, that are not almighty, that are not all-knowing, that are not present everywhere, everywhere, and that are not uncreated. Do you understand the difference now? Let me repeat it again. What does henotheism mean in respect to what people believe the Bible teaches and in relation to certain Christians like Mike Heiser? Because Mike Heiser is a henotheist. Now, before you guys bring out your stones and your baseball bats and start slaughtering people, Hear me out, understand this view, and then we're going to pour into the scriptures to see, does the Bible teach monotheism or henotheism? With me there? Does the God-breathed revelation teach monotheism or henotheism? So henotheism teaches there's only one eternal, uncreated, timeless, Almighty, all-knowing, ever-present God. And that God is Jehovah. And he happens to be the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinitarian God, the triune God. And yet, the one God created a host of lesser gods, gods that are finite, limited, temporal, that derive their power and authority from the true God, that pose no challenge to the true God, are incapable of rivaling the true God, whom the true God can wipe out of existence in a nanosecond without any threat to his supremacy. Okay? You understand what henotheism is now? See, already you guys started attacking. Notice the assumption. Okay. That's why I said, before you take out the stones, take out the baseball bats, Hear what this position entails before you assume that you can't be a true Christian and be a henotheist. See, already you guys have condemned any Christian that would believe this, even if he's a Trinitarian. Be patient, can you? Can you guys be patient? Henotheism in respect to the Bible and those Christians who embrace it first and the last, okay? Remember, henotheism may have a different meaning if you're <clears throat> describing, let's say, Hinduism or Mormonism, right? That's why I was clear in the beginning, I'm going to define henotheism and monolatry in respect to the Bible and to the beliefs of those Christians who hold to it. See, I was clear. Because henotheism won't have this precise exact meaning when applied, let's say, to Mormonism or Hinduism. With me there? Am I clear? And I'm not boring you because this is not going to be as entertaining, but I hope it's going to be educational and deep and informative. Okay. What does monolatry mean? Monolatry is directly tied in to henotheism. Why? Monolatry basically means the worship of one. Though there are many gods, there's only one God worthy of worship, one God that you slave for, one God that you love unconditionally, one God that you live for, one God that you devote your entire being and existence to. That's monolatry. You want me there? So henotheism, monolatry, in respect to this topic, to those Christians who believe that the Bible teaches henotheism, right? Henotheism, monolatry, 
are two sides of the same coin. They go hand in hand. Monolatry is the doctrine there's only one God worthy of worship. There are many gods in existence, but there's only one supreme God who is uncreated, almighty, all-knowing, ever-present, and this one God is the sole creator, sustainer of all creation. Let me repeat that because I didn't emphasize that enough. In henotheism, in this form of henotheism, as believed by Trinitarian Christians like Mike Kaiser, because Mike Kaiser is a henotheist. Michael Kaiser is a henotheist. The one supreme God, he is the sole creator and sustainer and life giver of all creation. Right? And he alone is worthy of worship. So that's what monolatry is. Henotheism, though you have a host of gods, there's only one eternal, almighty, all-knowing, present everywhere, creator, sustainer, and life giver. And that one God, he is supreme, unrivaled, incomparable, unmatched. And that's the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And he alone is worthy of all worship and unconditional love and, and sacrifice. Is that clear? Did I define the terms? Did it make sense? Did it sink in? Before I move on. Who's confused? Sorry, I know a lot of people don't like when I get loud. It's just my nature. I get loud. I'm an angry person by nature. Okay. With that said, let me talk to you, talk about what people, they distract me right when I'm about to teach. Okay. With that said, let me talk about what academia scholarship has been teaching in colleges and seminaries since the 18th century, the 1700s, with the rise of critical, unbelieving, biblical scholarship. Okay? In the 1700s in Germany, a school of biblical criticism arose which denied that the Bible is the inspired and errant word of God, which denied the traditional historic understanding of the authorship of the books of the Bible. For example, this school <clears throat> denied that Moses wrote the Pentateuch and even questioned whether writing was in vogue at the time of Moses and whether Moses existed. And this type of scholarship also called into question the existence of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This type of scholarship was influenced by evolution. Now, you may think evolution has only affected science, biology. Evolution has crept in like leaven unchecked and permeates not just science, but even theology and history. Because they have a concept of the evolution of religion. So this type of scholarship taught that the Israelites may have actually been Canaanites, or if they were not Canaanites, obviously they were Western Semitic people that lived amongst the Canaanites and came out of the Canaanites and pretty much <clears throat> inherited the Canaanite religion. Now, let me explain to you what these scholars started teaching, and you'll find the same scholarship taught in Bible colleges and seminaries so that if you're going to a Bible college or a university or a seminary, you'll be exposed and taught these assumptions, these presuppositions, these beliefs. Okay. Now, thank God you have Christians that refute this type of scholarship. But unfortunately, you have Christians who have embraced and endorsed this type of scholarship. So here's what they believe. Are you now ready? Now we're going to go deep. Isn't it amazing? Yesterday we had about like 180. Today we're down 88. Thank you, Christian Prince. Okay. Now let's go a little deep. Follow with me here. Okay. They taught that pretty much the Israelites, because they're West Semitic people who lived in Canaan, who were influenced by the Canaanites, their religion was pretty much the Canaanite religion. So they believe early on the Israelites were polytheists like the Canaanites. And they they take <laughs> I'm laughing because Abdul Halaj is going to get a good laugh. They believe that the Israelites 
actually thought that the chief god was Il, E L. Let me spell it here. E L. Il, it's L, but I say E L because I don't want it to sound like the letter L. And that originally they called him El Shaddai. And that at one time they believed that Yahweh was one of his sons, one of the gods. So Yahweh wasn't the chief god. Yahweh was one of the gods, the sons of Il. But as the Israelites evolved, their religious beliefs evolved, so an evolution in religion. So in time, Yahweh and Il became the same person, the same being. Okay, are you with me there? Before I move on, I want you to understand what this type of scholarship that sprung forth from Germany in the 18th century, that has now spread like gangrene and cancer in our colleges and universities and seminaries, this is what they taught. So just like you have evolution in science, you have evolution in religion. Okay, now follow with me, guys. Please follow with me. Of course, it's a denial of the Trinity rational phobia. They don't believe the Trinity is, is true because they don't believe that the God of the Bible exists, rational phobia. Remember, these were skeptics and some of them were atheists who were either, if they were not atheists, they were deists. So they were deists, if not atheists. Some were agnostic, meaning there may be a God, but he doesn't do the things the Bible says he does. And the Bible's not his word, Right? Or there may be a God, there may not be a God. Or outright atheists. Okay, but now pay attention because I want you, I want you to follow this because it's quite interesting. It's quite funny. So Israel originally, being West Semitic people who lived in Canaan, influenced by the Canaanites. In fact, I've even heard scholars posit that the Israelites may have been a clan of the Canaanites. They may have been Canaanites. That in time separate from Canaanites, and assume a different identity. All type of wild theories, because they don't believe the Old Testament is actual sacred history, that it's historically accurate. It's a bunch of myths. They even question the existence of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So you see the hand of Satan behind this scholarship that's destroying the faith of Christians. In fact, the 18th century, because of this school of theology, the onslaught on the minds and the hearts of Christians was terrible. Many people lost their faith. Right? But glory to the triune God. When Satan attacks, God's army is empowered and God raises up soldiers with his almighty power to then strike back and take captive and destroy the influence of the kingdom of darkness. But anyway, follow with me. So follow this exactly, Mike A.D. Follow this theory. The Israelites were polytheists. They believed in the plethora of gods. And the chief god was Il or Il Shaddai. One of his sons, one of his sons was Yahweh, Jehovah. With me? Later on, later on, the Israelites... Collapse the identity of Il and Jehovah into one, making them one and the same God, one and the same person, one and the same being. So at one time, Il was different from Jehovah and the father of Jehovah. Then later on, Israel, because it started evolving in their religious beliefs and understanding, collapsed Jehovah into the identity of Il. So now Jehovah was Il, Il is Jehovah. They're one and the same. But still... They did not think that Jehovah was the only God. They believed Jehovah was the chief God. And they came to the conviction he was the creator of the heavens and the earth. But he created these other gods that the nations could worship, but they were forbidden from worshiping. So they'll tell you that before the Babylonian captivity, before the Jews were taken into captivity in the 6th century BC by the Babylonians, the Israelites were henotheists and monolatrists. They believe Jehovah was the supreme God who created all things and created the gods, and he alone were, was to be worshipped by them, but these other gods exist, and the nations were allowed to worship those gods. There is no difference, Isaac. It's a difference in pronunciation. It's like saying Yeshua, Jesus. What's the difference? Yeshua is the Hebrew form, 
and Jesus is the anglicized form. No difference. Don't get caught up on that. Now, everyone with me so far? You understand what they what these scholars in seminary, in universities, and colleges are teaching? Folks, you understand what this means? The pastors that are coming out of these institutions are being exposed to this type of teaching. Where do you think Mike Heiser got his view of the divine counsel from? Michael Heiser, where do you think he learned and discovered this understanding of the heavenly counsel from this type of scholarship that he was exposed to in seminary, in university? He basically admits it because you'll see that he'll be referencing these scholars in his books and interacting with these sources. Everyone there? So I'm going to go real slow with this one. Pedro, are you wondering or you know why? Now you know why they're having a bad time, a hard time. Because this is the kind of scholarship that's permeating our institutions. The gangrene, the leaven of sin. Right? So when did the Israelites become monotheists? When did they start believing there's only one God in existence? Depends on which scholars you ask because there's still a debate. Some scholars will tell you, do you know when the Israelites started believing there's only one God and all other gods were false? They were not truly gods? You know when they, they posit that this became the belief of the Israelites? You know when this happened? According to these scholars? Anyone can take a guess? Anyone, anyone, any guesses? When did the Israelites start believing? Pedro, are you listening to me, brother? You're killing me, man. I'm about to hang myself. I just told you, Pedro, they believed the Israelites were henotheists and monolatrists up until the Babylonians took them into captivity in the 6th century BC, right? 500 years before the birth of Christ. What do you mean at the time, Moses? Pedro, are you here? Earth calling Pedro. Come on, carnal. Come on, Ese. Andrew Martin, you're killing me too, man. Oh, my goodness. Either I'm not communicating clearly, you guys are not getting it. Andrew, how can these scholars believe that the Israelites became monotheists at the time of Abraham when they questioned the existence of Abraham? And I just said, they believe that the Israelites were henotheists and monolatrists up until the time of the Babylonian captivity. No, even then, they don't believe... They were monotheists, right, with Akhenaten, the influence of Egypt, because they would have been henotheists. So let me repeat again. These scholars say the Israelites were henotheists and monolatrists because they came to a point in which they started believing Yahweh was the same as Eel, and he was the supreme creator God, but other gods exist that they were not to worship, even though nations could worship, that was their belief until they were taken into captivity by the Babylonians. Sixth century BC in the 500s before Christ. So when do you think these scholars believe the Israelites went from monotheism, I'm sorry, henotheism to monotheism? When? When do you think that happened? When they returned from Babylonian captivity. That means the Israelites were not monotheists until after they were released from Babylon. And some scholars doubt whether they were still monotheists. Let me repeat this. You guys got to get this information. Do not let me confuse you. Okay, so these scholars believe it was only when the Israelites came out of Babylon, when they were released from Babylonian captivity, which took place, Near the end of the 6th century, from that moment on, the Israelites became monotheists and denied the existence of other gods. But there, there are other scholars who say, no, that's not true. They still maintain their henotheism even up to the time of Christ and after the time of Christ. Yep, under Persian rule, medic. So understand the confusion created by scholarship? So now you have two camps of scholars. The camp that says the Israelites only became monotheists when they left Babylon 
after the captivity. The other camp says, no, even at that time, there were still henotheists, and there were henotheists up until the time of Christ. And you know, one of the scholars that believes that, one of the scholars who believes that the Israelites were still henotheists even up until the time of Christ. You know who? No, Theos, you're not understanding that. Theos, Theosis, if you're not going to pay attention, I'm going to block you. Mike Heiser is a henotheist. Because if you've read your books, I'm going to call you out. Either you're ignorant, you didn't understand them, or you're lying to me. Does not Mike Heiser say... There is a divine council, and they are Elohim. They're all gods, but they are not Elohim in the sense that Jehovah is. Theos. Now, let me see how well you read. I've read Heiser, and I understand him much better than you do by your statement. Theosis, if you've read his Unseen Realm and watched his lectures, does he not say there is a divine council of Elohim? They are Elohim. They are gods. But they are not Elohim the way Jehovah's Elohim. So Jehovah is Elohim. And the angels or the sons of God are Elohim. They're all Elohim, but they are not Elohim like Jehovah is. They are Elohim. They're gods, but they are not God in the same sense that Jehovah is. So correct yourself and say you've misunderstood him because that's the definition of henotheism. I know. I've read him. I've studied him carefully. So don't ever misrepresent Heiser to me. Okay? And you may think, because I think you're getting defensive. Okay, but now, wait, 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 wait. Didn't you just say he's a monotheist? But now you just admit he qualifies Elohim. So you admit he does believe they're Elohim, they're God. So why would you say he's a monotheist? That's henotheism, theosis. Don't argue with me, friend. You just proved my point. That's, that's exactly what henotheism is. That Jehovah is the one true, uncreated Elohim, almighty Elohim. These Elohim, they are Elohim. They are gods, but not gods in the sense that Jehovah is. That's henotheism. Theosis. So I'm going to be charitable and give you the benefit of the doubt that you're not understanding what henotheism means. But please, don't tell me he's a monotheist in the traditional sense. The term monotheism, as used by Christians, means only one God, there is no other. What Mike Heiser believes, and those who follow him, is not monotheism in that sense. They believe in henotheism. They say gods exist, but they are created gods, temporal gods, finite gods, they are not God in the sense that Jehovah is. Only Jehovah is uncreated, almighty, all-knowing, present everywhere. And he alone is the creator and life giver of all creation. And he alone is worthy of worship. John MacArthur would be a traditional monotheist, praise the Lord. John MacArthur, James White, John Piper, they would all be traditional monotheists. Monotheists embracing monotheism as defined traditionally. But guess what? People like Heisen and others would say because they're not educated in the literature. They are not well <clears throat> learned in the literature. And they're embracing a form of monotheism that was only understood and defined in the medieval period, in the medieval ages. Before we get into who uses what, Heiser, guys, just follow with me. Can you follow with me first? I'm trying to educate you on the issue so we can move on. Okay, Theos. You get, what, you get my point? You understand? Okay. Let me repeat because we went on a tangent that was related. So the questions were related. Okay. Let's, let's try this again. There are two camps of scholars regarding the religious beliefs of the Israelites after the Babylonian captivity. When they returned from Babylon, when they were set free by Cyrus. One camp says that's when they became monotheists. The other camp says no, they still remained henotheists even up until the time of Christ. One of the scholars that actually argues that they were still henotheists even at the time of Christ, guess who, folks? Mike Heiser. 
Mike Kaiser is one of those scholars that says the Israelites were still henotheist up until the time of Christ and even afterwards. And you know what he uses to prove that they are henotheists? Do you know what he uses to prove they are henotheists? The Dead Sea Scrolls. Because in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it mentions the heavenly council and calls those members Elohim, gods. Just like Melchizedek is called an Elohim, God, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Jesus has raised the Bible. Can you be patient and not assume that you're right because you're wrong? Elohim is used of angels too. Just be patient, man. Can you guys be patient or no? You're going to start pontificating and make all these mistakes that I need to correct and take more time getting to the point? So you guys understand now what is before us, the issues at hand. Does the Bible teach monotheism or does it teach henotheism? You just did. Jesus is raised. Let me repeat what you said. The Bible calls them Elohim because it's referring to these beings that are called by pagans ruling over the pagans. Okay, so who are ruling over the pagans? Those wrongly worshipped as gods, like Baal. So you're not saying they're false gods? Be patient. Okay. So, do you understand now the difference between henotheism? But then you're wrong, Jesus is right. So now you just see, you may, you're making me waste time because I understood what you said and I corrected you. No, because even angels are called gods. And not all angels are rebellious angels. Do you want to be patient, Jesus is right, or do you want to keep distracting and pontificating so that you cause me to stumble and distract people and ride them to the time, or do you just want to sit and listen and learn? Brother, tell me what you want to do. Here, let me just give you the – here, go ahead. Take the mic. Go ahead, brother. When you guys make statements that are not true, I have to correct them because I don't want you to present misinformation. Instead of telling me what you think, listen, learn, go back and study. And if I'm wrong, may God save you from those mistakes, correcting me not to repeat them. Stop chiming in with error that I have to correct because it's going to take this session longer than necessary. You understand now? Okay. Let me now repeat the point. Let me repeat the point. You have now two views at hand. Monotheism, monotheism, as understood by most Christians today, only one God, no other God exists, even lesser gods, because those gods that the Bible refers to are false gods that are not gods at all. And you have henotheism. Gods do exist besides the one true God, but they are finite limited temporal whom the one true God created who derived their strength their life their power authority from the one true God whom the one true God can wipe out of existence and they pose no threat no match to the one true God and that one true God he alone is almighty all-knowing present everywhere uncreated he alone is the creator sustainer of all things these are the two positions before us Related to henotheism is also the belief only that one true God is to be worshipped. Okay? Now, see, already you assume that to hold to henotheism is blasphemous. Okay, let me now let the cat out of the bag and let me surprise you. Are you guys ready? Are you ready? Let me say this again, and you got to ask the Spirit to convict you and show you if I'm right or not, because you guys already consigned these people to hell. Okay. Let me repeat this. Hear me carefully. You can be a Trinitarian who believes the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God and hold to henotheism. Let me repeat that again to shock some of you. You can be a Trinitarian who believes the one true God is triune, Father, Son, and Spirit who believes the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God, and hold to henotheism. 
Now, that doesn't mean it's right. Doesn't mean it's wrong. It means you can be a true believer and believe that. And hence, Mike Kaiser. And hence, Larry Hurtado went to be with the Lord. And hence, Richard Balcom. He's not the only one. The most popular exponent of this view is Mike Kaiser. He has made this view popular. He has made this view accessible and acceptable and widespread. But he did not originate this view. He's the most po popular proponent of this view. These are the current state of Bible scholars and theologians and a growing. Remember, I'm into full-time ministry. And because I'm into full-time ministry, I have to study these sources, right? It has nothing to do with denomination, Anna. What's the denomination got to do with it? So now you see why Theosis was trying to argue tooth and nail it's monotheism. Because he got scared because he adopts the view of Heiser. We'd condemn him as a heretic and consign him to the flames of hell. You with me there? So this is why he got nervous. But if he was patient, he'd see where I'm going with this. Let me repeat for a third time. Let me repeat for a third time. You can be a Trinitarian who believes the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God and hold to henotheism and monolatry. That is not a denial of the true God. That is not blasphemy. And it doesn't undermine the Bible. In point of fact, they will tell you there are places in which there are beings who are called gods that are not false gods, which is why they believe it. And I want to look at that, their evidence or lack thereof. So are we now ready? Okay. Are, you, are we ready now to get into this topic? Thank you, Lisa. God bless you. Okay. So now that we got the issues on the table, see, this is why, guys, I keep telling you, you got to go back and re-listen and re-listen to these sessions, even upload them to your YouTube channels and take snippets and study this so that it becomes second nature. You understand the issues correctly, absorb them, and then can use them and teach others and share them for the glory of the triune God. There are a lot of issues out there in the world confronting our Christian witness and God, in his goodness, his faithfulness, and his love for us, is raising up men and women in all the ages, empowering them by the Spirit, with wisdom of the Spirit, to know these issues, interact with these issues, and refute error for the glory of the triune God. And be thankful you live at a time where all this information is a fingertip away. It's on the Internet for free. All you do is pay for your Internet, right? And it's there a fingertip away accessible, where you don't have to go broke, researching all this stuff and getting all these books. You guys are really blessed super abundantly, more than any other generation, with the amount of information that God has given you. But at the same time, what God uses for good, Satan uses for evil. At the same time, there hasn't been a time like this where now Satan is spreading his lies, his falsehoods, and his agenda at such a rapid pace that's unparable, unparalleled, I'm sorry, unparalleled at any other time in history. Because he too is using the internet to spread misinformation, lies, blasphemies, false views, false religions, right, all over the world, and it's a fingertip away. So there's a battle. God is using this internet for his glory, and Satan's using the same internet to deceive, mislead, and misinform. And the one who wins is God, because Satan is a creature under the feet of Jesus, crushed by the feet of Jesus, destroyed by the blood of the cross of Jesus, and we plead the blood of Jesus to cover us and the spirit to seal us, and by the blood of Jesus, we have crushed him and conquered him, and we will destroy his kingdom by the blood of the cross of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name.
You want me there? So I just want to take a minute to say you need to be thankful and appreciative and on your knees thanking the Triune God. Thank you for these resources where you make all of these tools available out of your grace, free of charge, so I can truly know you as you are and get greater depth and understanding in respect to your Bible that you preserve which is your voice to me, and raised up men and women with integrity, whom you empower by your spirit, whom you'll preserve by your spirit, to then guide me to the truth and the correct understanding of your word, to save me from the lies and misinformation of the devil and his children. Thank you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Right? You got it now? And I pray I'm one of those men God is using for his glory. May he keep me humble and pure and righteous and in love with him. Okay, with that said, let's go into some of the passages that Trinitarians, let me repeat this again. Hear me clear, clearly. Trinitarians who love the triune God, who worship the triune God, who believe the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. The passages they use to show, though the triune God is supreme, the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, these three persons of the one God created these lesser gods. So they're not telling you these gods call into question the Trinity or challenge the Trinity or equal to the Trinity or that Jesus is one of these gods. That's what the Jehovah's Witnesses do. Jehovah's Witnesses use these same passages, the same information to teach. See, Jesus is one of these gods. Trinitarians like Mike Heiser are not using this information to say, see, Jesus is not part of the Trinity. Jesus isn't God Almighty. He's one, he's one of these lesser gods. Quite the opposite. Mike Heiser and those who believe like him say, Jesus is the Almighty God. He's the visible Yahweh that appeared in the Old Testament as Yahweh in visible form, and the Father is the invisible Yahweh, and the visible Yahweh became flesh, became Jesus of Nazareth, so he is the eternal God, the supreme God, the almighty God, who created these other gods. He's a Trinitarian. You with me there? I'm going to show you the passages that... Heiser and other Trinitarians use. So I want you to keep this in your mind. They're not heretics. They're not blasphemers. They're not robbing the glory of the triune God or denying the Bible. No, that's not true. They love and worship the Trinity. They love the Bible and believe it's inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. In fact, Theosis is an example right here. Theosis is one of them. Theosis believes in the Trinity. He worships and loves the Trinity. He believes the Bible is the inspired, inerrant word of God, preserved by God, the voice of God, and the only written word of God. But he believes other gods exist. Am I right, Theosis? Am I right? I know. I used to think it was a heresy. They are Trinitarian henotheists, praise the Lord. They are Trinitarian henotheists. What do you mean, what are they? Anna, you're going to have to ask God to help you not to make something more than it is to know which battles to fight and which battles to put aside because they're not worth fighting for and dying for. I know in your zeal and love for the triune God, you think it's heresy. It's not. It's not. At one time, I used to think it was years ago because the only group that I heard Preaching henotheism were anti-Trinitarian heretics. So you see how beautiful and majestic God is? Guys, let me show you how beautiful and majestic God is. The anti-Trinitarian heretics thought that by promoting henotheism, they would deny the Trinity and rob Jesus of his glory. Lo and behold, here comes folks like Mike Heiser and says, nah, not so fast. The Bible does teach the Trinity. The Trinity is true. It is a fact of revelation. The triune God does live. Jesus is Jehovah Almighty, and other gods exist. 
Now what do you got to say? Now what do you got to say? You get it now? So when I first was introduced to it, I had a problem with it. Now I know because I understand where they're coming from and why they see it the way they do. So if you're ready, you know I'm going to have to do more than one session on this. Because obviously, you see, every topic I start, I have to lay a foundation, provide the background, define terms before I can get into the meat of the matter, right? Right? You want me there? We're going to get there, Steve. Steve, patience is one of the fruits of the spirit that I need to cult cultivate because I lack patience. Your patient will get there. Your patient will get there. Just trust me. Okay, we'll get there in time, patient. Okay, before I show you the text they use, let me show you some of the passages these liberal critics of the Bible who do not believe in the Bible as historically accurate or inspired, who adopt an evolutionary model of the religious history of Israel, some of the passages they use to prove that early in Israelite history, early in Israelite history, the Israelites were polytheists who thought that El Shaddai, Il, was a supreme god, and Yahweh, Jehovah, was one, one of his sons. And then as time went on, they progressed into thinking that Yahweh, Jehovah, and Il are one and the same. Let me show you what passage they use in support of that. Are you guys ready? Yeah, but Anna, go into the writings of the church fathers. See, Anna, unless you peruse the writings of the church fathers and study them with great depth to see what they said about the council, don't be shocked to find, don't be shocked to find that even in the early church fathers, they would recognize the existence of gods of a lesser kind. All right? But now let me show you the passage. Just pay attention, Anna. All right? Just pay attention. Just be patient. Don't don't panic. You don't have to believe this. Just listen. Hear me out and pray. Just be patient. But you owe it to yourself because the church fathers, there's too many writings of the church fathers. Unless you've studied them all to know what they would say about these texts, hold judgment because you may be surprised to find that the church fathers also shared a view that, yeah, these are gods of a lesser kind. Right? After all, Anna... In your tradition, you believe you will become God, will become gods. Theosis, even the name Theosis. And didn't the church fathers quote certain Old Testament passages to prove, see, we will be gods? Should I panic and say, oh, wait, Anna, hold on. What are you talking about? Theosis, you're going to be gods. Woo, right? Anna, it's all <clears throat> semantics. So you're okay that God in his grace will make you a God, but you're not okay that God in his grace created, created lesser gods. You see the inconsistency? No, you'll literally become a God. You don't deny that. You're going to be a God. Because it says that Jesus became man so that we could become God. Isn't that a saying? You will literally become a God. It's like saying you're not literally a daughter of God. Yeah, but Anna, see, you're still not listening. How does by grace change the fact you're going to be a God? And someone will tell you, yeah, by grace, God created these other gods to be gods. So you're going to refute yourself using this argumentation. They're going to say you're being selective. You're okay with the belief of the Orthodox that by grace, I'll be a God. But you're not okay with the true God by grace creating other gods to exist. Anna, sister, you're now disappointing me. Are you saying that the henotheists believe that these other gods are uncreated? So you're arguing like them and making the same point they are, but you don't see your inconsistency because you're closed-minded. Are you listening to yourself? You're making their case for them. But I'm not going to be uncreated. And they'll tell you, neither are these gods uncreated. Yeah, but it's by grace I'm going to be a god. And they'll tell you, yeah, by grace he created them to be gods of a lesser kind. You're making their case for them, Anna. You'd actually be a great apologist for them. You get my point, Anna? I love you, sister. But don't be so reactionary. 
No, that's not Mormonism. Praise the Lord. Mormonism. No, it's okay. I don't want you to shut up. It's okay. We interact. You're my sister. And I'm going to challenge you because I love you. What do you think I'm doing? It's I'm trying to sharpen you and challenge you. And note, I believe in theosis in that the Bible does teach we will be transformed to become like Christ, to be as God is in his immortality and moral incorruption. It is a biblical teaching. So when I read, let's say, a church father saying Jesus became man so we can become God, right? You know the church fathers taught it, right? I don't say, oh, he, ah, oh, ah, oh. Right? I don't do that, right? Right, Anna? And by the way, Anna, you know as, as well as I do, the Mormons quote the church fathers to teach that the church fathers believed in a host of gods. Yeah, I'll do it again, DJ. Did you know that? Folks, are you aware the Mormons also goldmine the church fathers where the church fathers say that we will become gods to say, see, Joseph Smith didn't make it up. Ha, he, woo, ha, woo, ha. Okay. But what the Mormons don't tell you, and this will answer your question, praise the Lord. What the Mormons don't tell you is they do not believe Billions of gods exist that God the Father was a man who had a God over him. And when that man became God, he still had a physical body and he had sex wives that he slept with. And then he got one of his wives pregnant with Jesus and then also sired Lucifer. And that we were pre existent spirit children of God the Father. And we came to the earth. To become men so we can become gods of our own planets. That's not what the church fathers taught. Right? What they meant. Let me ex explain what the church fathers meant. And it's biblical. Listen to me. What the church fathers meant. And it's biblical. I'll give you the verses later. We humans will be transformed. To partake of the divine nature. 2 Peter 1 verse 4. Go ahead, post it. 2 Peter 1, verse 4. 2 Peter 1, verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Wow! We believers in Christ partake, share in the nature of God, the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So what does it mean I share in the divine nature? I will be a God. I will become like God in that I will become morally incorruptible. No more lust. No more sinful passions. Morally incorruptible. And I will be immortal and never die. That's what it means. That's what the fathers meant. That's theosis. Steven Universe, that's easy to explain by the henotheists. I'll come back to that. Okay, you understand? So Anna, the church fathers were right. By grace, I will become, quote unquote, a God, a son or daughter of God. And I will be like God because I'll share in his nature in this sense. I won't be uncreated. Impossible. I'm a creature. I won't be almighty. I won't be all-knowing. I won't be present everywhere. That's true only of the true God. But I will be a God, a son of God, or a daughter of God, and that I will share in God's nature in this way. Like God, I'll be immortal, deathless. Like God, I'll be morally incorruptible. But what was my point? Exactly. You won't be worshipped. What was my point? And that's one of many verses, folks, I can show you. That this understanding of the early church was right. Theosis. It is biblical. So the Orthodox are right here. Theosis is a biblical teaching. And it was a teaching believed by the early church fathers. What's my point? If you can believe that about human creatures becoming gods in that sense, the henotheist will say, so then what's your problem with me, Anna, in saying the Almighty God created spirit creatures to be gods in a lesser sense, because of his grace. What's the difference? You see the point? You get my point?
Thank you, Croatia. God bless you. Anna, that's your belief. They're saying that's what you believe. But even now, Anna, before you're perfected, you're being transformed into what you'll become. Are you not already a daughter of God? Yes. Do you not already share in the divine nature? That's what Second Peter 1 4 says. So before the perfection, you're already being divinized, glorified slowly but surely, even in your imperfect state. So they're going to tell you, okay, you believe that about human believers redeemed. Why then would you say, I'm a blasphemer when I say the true triune God created a host of spirit creatures to be gods, Elohim, but they're created, they're finite, they're temporal. They owe their life and power to him, the source of their existence, and it's by his grace that he made them what they are. That's what they're going to tell you, Adam. Okay, anyway, I made, I think I made my case. I'm not saying believe in henotheism. I, I'm, I'm sure I was clear, right? I'm not making you henotheists or monolatrists. I'm saying these are the two positions in Trinitarian Christian belief, whether you like it or not. Among Trinitarian Christians today, you have two camps, monotheists in the traditional sense, henotheist monolatrists. Both camps believe in one true, almighty, all-knowing, ever-present, uncreated, triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus is God Almighty, became flesh, two natures, one person. The Bible inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God, historically accurate, the revelation of God. They both believe that. And only the trying God is to be worshipped. Clear? What's up, Tatiana? What's up, girlfriend? She's shocking me. Poor girl, I give her a hard time. I give this sweet Assyrian sister a hard time in the other channels. And look, out of her grace and love, she decided to repay my being a thorn in her sign with love. Now you make me feel guilty, Tatiana. Because you made me feel guilty, I'm going to have to block you on Facebook. <laughs> All right. Okay, everyone clear? God bless that sister. Pray for her. She's a warrior for, and I don't just say this, not because she's a Syrian. Pray for her and her children. She's a warrior who loves Jesus, right? Okay, now, now that we got that, everyone with me? Guys, thank you for your patience. When there is a question related to the topic, I will address it. Remember I said question related to the topic, and I want to give clarification so that no one gets confused. So Anna is a blessing to me. She truly is. She's been a main supporter who loves me and my family and prays for me. And I'm blessed to serve this sister for Christ. So again, I'm loud by nature. So don't think I'm yelling and shouting and putting you guys. That's just my nature. I'm an angry person because every time I see myself on screen, I'm upset that I don't look like Brad Pitt and have the body of Arnold Schwarzenegger. So I'm just angry by nature. All right. Now with that said, just to bring some comedy relief. Okay. It's okay, Luisa. Just to, again, lighten things up. You want me to do a uh, DN news? Do you want me to do that manifestation again? Oh, he, ah, ooh, I'm panicking. Oh, no. There are other gods. Help. All right. All right. Now with that said. Boy, anyone who watches these live streams is going to think this guy needs to be put in a straitjacket, right? Oh, okay. He wants me to do my... Very calm, monotone, not loud, in your face, rude presentation. He wants me to do the calm, scholarly. Uh, dear Anna, you're still not getting the metaphysical underpinnings of your theological system. Don't you understand that by grace, God can create lesser gods? And it's still grace that they exist as gods, but they're not on the level of the one true God. And therefore, Anna, you're making a mountain out of a molehill. But if you really understand, you'll see that the preponderance of the evidence overwhelmingly points to the likelihood that henotheism is true. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Sure. Do you guys like my, uh, should I do that impression? <laughs> I got mental issues, seriously. Boy. Do you want me to do Bob the Builder now? Because he was here yesterday. He did a hit and run. Hold on. Let me see it is. Let me get this. Bob the Builder. Have you seen him? I can't do him perfectly, but I did him yesterday. No, I can't do James White. That's a hard impression. 
Bob the Builder. You know when he yelled at Ali Dawa? I'm not growing. Just said that by grace, we will be gods. So now, Anna, if you can be gods and you're human, why then can't angels be gods? Can you please speak to the camera? Folks, you listen. Everyone there? Okay, guys, let's get into some of the passages now. No, that I can't. Isaac, you want me to just turn the entire session into impersonations? What's wrong with you, dude? Get off your horse. More <laughs> horsey, more horsey. All right, come on. Let's come back to the issue. Let me now show you a passage that liberal critical scholars use to prove that the Israelites originally were polytheists who believed in El Shaddai, Eel, as the chief god over a host of gods, and that these gods were his sons, and one of his sons was Jehovah, Yahweh. Let me show you what passage they used to prove that. Are you ready? They have two. There are two Old Testament texts that they point to showing that these texts, right, are archaic because their language, very old. The style, the form of composition, the Hebrew is very archaic, showing that these are some of the oldest passages in the Hebrew Bible, so that it comes from a period before the Israelites became monotheists. Okay, everyone with me there? Right? And they go, if you then look at these pa passages, they actually show... What the Israelites initially be believed before they evolved into a monotheistic group. And the two passages, and by the way, Abdul Halaj is here too. He reads Hebrew. They'll tell you it's Deuteronomy 32 and Psalm 82. The scholars will tell you that Deuteronomy 32 and Psalm 82, these two passages, the style, the Hebrew, the composition, very ancient and archaic. The way it's written, the Hebrew style, you know, it's, it's symmetry indicates that it is, they are an older composition coming from a period early on in Israelite religious history. Psalm 82 and Deuteronomy 32. And they'll say that also, <clears throat> Judges chapter 4 and 5 betray a very ancient form of text that the way it's written, the style, the language, very archaic, very old, showing that these documents, these sources are much older than the books in which they're found. Okay, this is what they say. This is their belief. And if Abdul Halaj is here, he'll tell you. He reads the Hebrew. He can testify that there are Hebrew expressions and words in Deuteronomy 32 that show that it's a very old Hebrew composition. And they'll say the same is true with Psalm 82. Now, with that said, with that said, we're going to read ESV because the reading found in ESV is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls and supported by the Greek version. The Dead Sea Scrolls and the Greek version retain... A specific line in Deuteronomy 32.8 have a form in Deuteronomy 32.8 that is different from the labor, later Hebrew manuscripts produced by the Mesorites after the time of Christ. So the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Greek version read the same way in Deuteronomy 32.8. They render a specific form of the text that is different from the form of the text that the later Hebrew manuscripts, which the Mesorites copy, read. Are you with me there? The later Hebrew copies, they're called the Mesoretic textual tradition, the Mesoretic text. Those copies are written centuries after Christ, written by a group of Jews called the Mesorites, starting in the 400s. And in Deuteronomy 32.8, in those copies produced by those Jewish scribes, they retain a form of the Hebrew that's different from what we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls of Deuteronomy 32, which is much older than Christ, 
right? And confirmed and backed up by the Greek version. The Greek version agrees with the Dead Sea Scrolls in the way the Dead Sea Scrolls reads in Deuteronomy 32.8. Now, for you to understand what I'm saying, let's look at Deuteronomy 32, verse 8 in English Standard Version, because the English Standard Version is based on the Dead Sea Scrolls version. In Jesus' name, I hope I'm clear. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. Right there. See, this is based on the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scroll says that God divided the nations according to the number of the sons of God. God apportioned each son of God a particular group of people to rule over. Do you guys see it? This is the reading found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, backed up by the Greek version, because in the Greek version, it says these sons of God are the angels of God. God bless you, Gabriel, and preserve you. In fact, do me a favor, Protestant, and first and last, post ESV and the English translation of the Greek version back to back. See, he posted the Greek. And if you look at it, it says, kata, arithman, where we get arithmetics. There's the Greek word for arithmetics. Kata, according arithman, the number angelon theu, angelon theu. You see it? Now let's let's... Look at the English Standard Version's rendering of the Dead Sea Scrolls and a Greek or English translation of the Greek. Okay, here is ESV again. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. So let me explain this, folks. Let me explain what it's saying here. God divided the nations into different people people groups so that a son of God could then rule over each specific group of people. So let's say if the number of sons of God were 70, God divided the nations into 70 nations, 70 people groups, and assigned each group of people to a specific son of God to rule over. Now the question is, who are these sons of God? First of all, gave you the Greek version telling you how the Jews that translated Deuteronomy 32 into Greek understood the phrase sons of God. So who are the sons of God? Read it. When the Most High divided the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the nations according to the number of the angels of God. Did you catch it, folks? Don't be distracted. Focus. The Dead Sea Scrolls retains a form of Deuteronomy 32.8 that says... The nations were divided according to the number of the sons of God. The Greek translation of Deuteronomy 32 also reads that the nations were divided according to the angels of God, telling you that the Greek version is based on the same form of the Hebrew text of Deuteronomy 32 <clears throat> as evidenced by the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Greek version are both preserving a form of the Hebrew of Deuteronomy 32.8 that says the nations were divided according to the number of the sons of God, which the Greek version understood to be angels. Who's not getting this? Before I move on. Do you understand the point or no? Because I can't move on if no one's getting it. Because I know you're praising God for this Muslim getting saved. May the Lord Jesus preserve him. But that too can be a distraction and you're going to lose the point. Everyone got it or no? Just want to make sure. Because I can't move on if you don't get it. Amen, Jojo. So if we go by the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Greek version, the nations were divided in accord with the number of who? The nations were divided in respect to, in reference to, in relation to the number of who? The sons of God in the Hebrew, which the Greek version translated as angels, right? Sons of God, which the translators 
of Deuteronomy into Greek understood to be angels. Okay, now why did I take all this time to repeat myself more than once and make sure you're getting it and going into this depth of information? Because now let's look at ESV one more time with this knowledge in, in, in mind. Now that you have the background in mind, God appointed the sons of God, which those Jews that translated Deuteronomy to Greek understood to be the angels. So God appointed these angels to rule over the nations. And he divided the nations in accord with the number of angels that would rule over them. In other words, if there are 70 nations, that's because God appointed 70 angels to rule over the 70 nations. You understand now? The implication of this reading, this variant, this form of the text? Yes, medic, exactly. Do you understand now the implication? If we go by this form of Deuteronomy 32, this variant reading, which is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Greek version, God appointed angels to rule over the nations. And the nations were divided in accord with the amount of angels that would rule over them. So if God said, hey, 70 angels, right? You 70? I'm going to divide the nations into 70. So each one of you, the 70, will have a nation to rule over. Right? And these angels of God in the Hebrew are said to be sons of God. Gabriel, God bless you. Pay attention. Stop with the distraction. Learn. We praise God you're saved, but this is the time to learn and not bring attention to yourself, brother. Sorry, I don't mean to be harsh, but you're repeating the same thing. We thank God for you, but now you have to endure to the end to show that you're truly born of the Spirit. Many begin the race, but only those who are born of the Spirit complete it. And in Jesus' name, I pray we all finish the race for the glory of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Sit back and learn, brother. Stop the distractions. Okay? No, actually, Jesus Christ is Lord. It will, according to them. The next verse will, according to them. They use that against you. So with that said, Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. One more time. Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. One more time. With that said. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind... He fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. Pay attention to two things. Number one, it doesn't say when Jehovah gave the nations their inheritance. It says when the Most High, Elion, Elion. Catch it. Did it say when Jehovah, Yahweh, did it or Elion did it? The Hebrew word is Elion. Let me get it for you. Guys, glory to the trying God for this amount of depth and meat. That's the grace of the Holy Spirit giving us this amount of depth, knowledge, understanding. Because I'm telling you, some people go to seminary to get this kind of information. Glory to Jesus Christ. We don't need seminary to get this information. We have the Holy Spirit. Okay. Let me show you. Okay. Here is the link to the interlinear. Here is the link to the interlinear. Okay. Click on it and see it says Elion. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, right? It's too bad here it doesn't retain the Hebrew. It says Israel. Bene Israel. All right, that's fine. All right. You see that there, right? Do you guys catch it? When the Most High divided the nations and allotted them their inheritance. That is to say, when Jehovah did it or the Most High did it, folks. Let me see if you're paying attention. Who did that? Who divided them? Elion, the Most High, right? You can also transliterate it as E-L-Y-O-N, okay? Notice, number one, doesn't say Jehovah did it. It says the Most High. And so the sons of God are the sons of who? They're the sons of the Most High, right? They're the sons of the Most High, right? Because the sons of God there are the sons of the Most High. The Most High 
happens to be the God who's the father of these sons. The sons of God are the sons of the Most High. Okay, now with that said, who gave the sons of God their share, their inheritance? Who told the sons of God which portion was theirs? The Most High, right? No, anyone doesn't come from Eel. Medic, focus, man. No, it's not from Eel. Okay. Who gave the sons of God their share? The Most High. The Most High gave the sons of God their share, their portion, their inheritance. Aha! Now read Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 to 9. Aha! Let's see if you catch it. Aha! Wake up, guys. Aha! Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 to 9. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. Who allotted Jacob to be Jehovah's heritage? Bam, I got you. Jacob was allotted to Jehovah to be his inheritance. Who allotted it to Jehovah? Bam! This is the passage they use to show that at one time, the Israelites believed Jehovah was a son of the Most High. No, the Lord is Jehovah. You're not getting it. This is the passage that the liberal critical scholars used to show. Here is evidence that slipped the pen of the scribes. The scribes forgot to change and correct this, giving us a window into early Israelite religion where Jehovah is allotted an inheritance. Someone is giving Jehovah his share, his allotment. Here you go, Jehovah. This is your inheritance. This is your portion. Who? The Most High. So Jehovah, the Son of the Most High. Wow! What do you mean, transliterate? Transliterate what? One more time. I, I obviously have to do a part two. Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 to 9. You mean translate? Transliterate is not mean. If you read Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 to 9, praise the Lord, this is the impression you get. The Most High gave the sons of God the nations as their inheritance. Jehovah was given an inheritance. Jacob was allotted to Jehovah as his inheritance. Who gave it to Jehovah? Who allotted it to Jehovah? That means someone gave Jehovah, allotted Israel to Jehovah as his inheritance. Who? Verse 8 tells you the Most High. Louisa, because you came in late, you are all over the place. You need to go back and listen from the beginning. So what I would recommend, rewind this to the beginning listen because you're going to get lost. You won't be able to follow. I just gave you the meaning, praise the Lord. Allahu Akbar. That's the meaning. What do you mean, what is the meaning? Are you listening? I just gave you the meaning. The Most High gave Jehovah his portion, his allotment, Israel. So that means Jehovah is one of the sons of the Most High. So these scholars who are critical, liberal, use this passage as an indication that see early in Israelite religion, they thought Jehovah was the son of the Most High. He wasn't the Most High. They're different. And only later on, that Israel changed their thinking into thinking Jehovah is Il, the Most High. So this passage is one of the oldest sources, documents in the Old Testament. And this passage slipped the pen of the scribes because the scribes obviously forgot to change it. Left it intact. Everyone got it? So if that's true, folks, what you have here is Jehovah as the son of the Most High, and the Most High said, Jehovah, here's your share, here's your inheritance, Israel. 
Wow! I don't know where I love Easter eggs means. What does that mean? I have no idea. You got it? But wait, the critical liberal scholars are using it to show Israelite religion evolved. They were not monotheists. And they didn't think Jehovah was the high God, Il, the most high. Yes, medic, that's what they use. But because you guys are sharp and smart and illuminated by the Holy Spirit, some of you said a passage pointing to the Trinity. Exactly. This doesn't prove that Israelite religion evolved and doesn't prove Jehovah isn't the most high. It actually proves you have two persons of God, right? The most high and his son, Jehovah, and they're the one God. In other words, you don't have to follow the right of, route of liberalism and assume, see, they were polytheists. No, see, they realized that Jehovah was the most high, but he was also the son of another who's Jehovah, who's the most high. Bam! Yes, medic. And medic, I wrote an article using this very argument against them to prove the Trinity. Can I give you the links to the article? Can I give you the links to the article before I'm finished? Let me go now to the second one. I'm going to give you where I turned it against them. I go, all right, I agree. The Most High is different from Jehovah here. And the Most High gave Jehovah his inheritance, Israel. But that doesn't prove polytheism. That proves the Trinity. Because here the Most High would be the Father and his Son would be Jesus. And Jesus, Jehovah, is the Most High, one with his Father. Thank you, liberals, for showing me proof from the Old Testament the Trinity is right and the Israelites who rejected the Trinity are wrong. You see that? So you don't have to say, no, 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 you're wrong. No, no, that, that destroys my faith. Wait, 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 wait. Jehovah here is the son of the most high? But wait, that same chapter says Jehovah is the supreme God, the only God. He is the most high. So there are two who are most high. The most high and his son, Jehovah, who's also the most high. Thank you for proving the father and son relationship in the Old Testament. Thank you. You get it now? Why you shouldn't be scared of this scholarship, but Christianize it, baptize it for the glory of the trying God, take it and use it and run with it. Take it captive for the glory of Jesus. Come on, man. Woo! And you want me to prove to you, you can use this text to confirm the New Testament, use this text to show it's Trinitarian. Go to Luke 132, folks. Luke 132. Jesus is said to be who? Exactly, Angie. Patience, you'll get it. Luke 132, guys. Read. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Whoa! The Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. Whoa! And then Luke 135. Isaac, it's the grace of the triune God, the almighty, almighty power of the Holy Spirit that empowers me to recall this information for the glory of Jesus. He gets the glory. Luke 135. Who is Jesus? Luke 135. We're waiting for Luke 135 before the rapture, Protestant. And the angel answered him, answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Whoa! Jesus, who is Jehovah. Jehovah Jesus, Son of God, Son of the Most High. Wow! Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 2. Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 2. So why are you scared of liberal scholarship? Take it captive for the glory of Jesus. Baptize it and Christianize it. Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 2. 
God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. So who appointed the Son to be the heir? Who allotted the Son his share, his portion, his allotment, his inheritance? The Father of Jesus, by whom also he made the worlds. Wow! Whoa there, Nelly. Amazing. Is Anna still here? Everyone else still here? Or did I put you guys to sleep? Everyone got it? So why would I, why would I freak out? Wait, wait. No, no. Jehovah can't be the son of the most high. No, that can't be possible. Say, wait, 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 wait. Music to my ears. Wait, wait, wait. This passage shows Jehovah has a father? Jehovah's the son of the Most High? You're kidding me. Because that same passage says, Jehovah, there is no other God besides him. Deuteronomy 32, verse 39. Deuteronomy 32, verse 39. And I'm going to blow you away with a final passage. And guys, God willing, pray for me. Tomorrow's my daughter's birthday. I got to do a birthday video telling her how much we love her and her sister and trusting Jesus will bring her to me. And I'll tell you what I plan to talk about this week. See now that I, even I am he. There is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. So wait, Jehovah says there is no other God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. But wait, 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 wait. Jesus, didn't you say, Jesus, no one can deliver out of your hand and you're the one who gives everlasting life? John 10, 28. John 10, 28. Whoa, man. John 10, 28. Watch here. What happened, Protestant? I love you, bro. And I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait. Jehovah just said in Deuteronomy 32, 39, there is no God beside me. I make alive. None can deliver out of my hand. Jesus says, not only do I make alive, I give everlasting life, and no one can deliver them out of my hand. Why do you sound like you're that Jehovah, Jesus, the son of the most high? But then John 10, 29. Thank you, Sylvia. God bless you, sister. John 10, 29. That same chapter. Hold on, Jesus. I'm confused. My father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Oh, my goodness. There's the father again, Jesus the son, but Jesus, like Jehovah, gives life, in fact, everlasting life. Like Jehovah, none can deliver out his hand, but so too the father, no one can deliver out of the father's hand. What is going on here? Now, I'm going to blow you away, and I have an article on this. Did you know, okay, the word in Hebrew and Aramaic, and Abdul Hadid, if you're here, I'm going to need you to chime in, or thou shalt not pontificate. The singular word for most high in Aramaic and Hebrew is Elyon, okay, Elyon. Now, the plural for most high in Aramaic, pay attention here. The plural for most high in Aramaic is El Yonin. Now, it will be transliterated this way, I believe. For some reason, they add a, a W, El Yonin, okay? Are you with me there? Send Montera to his business of being the dog, the, the dog pound. El Yonin, okay? Guys, pay attention. Singular, El Yon. Pay attention here. Plural in Aramaic. Aramaic is El Yonin, okay? Pay attention. Daniel 7.27. Daniel 7.27. No, Elyon is Hebrew and Aramaic. But in Aramaic, in Aramaic, the plural is in. Whereas in Hebrew, plural suffix is im, right? 
But in Aramaic, it's in. Okay, guys, pay attention here. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Now pay attention. The people of the saints of the Most High, the kingdom belongs to the Most High, all dominions shall serve and obey him, the Most High. You guys ready to get blown away? Do you guys want me to blow you away? Not me, really. It's the Bible. Who's excited, man? I'm excited for you. Here it is. Don't take my word for my word for it, you sinners. Click there. Please click there. Please click there. The word most high, you'll see it in front of your eyes. I'm not making it up. It's plural. El Yonin. And if you look at the bottom, you'll see ADJ dash MP, adjective masculine plural. It's the most highs, not most high. The kingdom of the most highs, the highest ones, plural. Do you know why it's plural? Let me show you why. Plural. Is Abdul Halaj here or is he gone? Thou shalt not pontificate. He's confirming this. Okay. Now, you know why it's plural? Why there are most highs? Let me show you from Daniel. Daniel 7, verses 9 to 10. Daniel 7, verses 9 to 10. In Jesus' name, may he keep you healthy for his glory. And you can listen to it later. I'm almost done anyway. I beheld to the thrones, pay attention, thrones, plural. Luis and everyone, thrones, plural, more than one, were cast down. And the Ancient of Days did sit. So there's one figure here, Ancient of Days. And he appears visibly, in, in visible shape. Whose garment was white as snow. So appears as an older person with a white garment. And the hair, hair of his head like the pure wool. So this figure, Ancient of Days, appears visibly with a white robe and white hair. So he's appearing as an older person. Thrones, more than one. The Ancient of Days takes one throne. Pay attention. And the stream issued and came forth from before him. Right, sorry. Did I skip something? Post it again. Like the pure, and his throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him and 10,000 times 10,000. Post Daniel 7, 9 one more time. Yep, four times Elionin appears. Okay. Daniel 7, verse 9. One more time. Guys, pay attention now. Don't get distracted. I beheld till thrones, more than one, were cast down. The Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. So this Ancient of Days is appearing in a visible form, in a visible shape. Daniel could see he's wearing a white robe, and he's got white hair, and he sits. On how many thrones does this Ancient of Days sit? One. He sits on one throne. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. Okay, Daniel, you saw two thrones. Yeah. One throne occupied by a being that appears as an older person, whom you call the Ancient of Days. This being has white hair and a white robe, but he takes one throne. The other throne is occupied by who, Daniel? Post Daniel 7, 13 to 14. And we're going to end it and do a part two tomorrow. These sessions are too long, don't you think? I should go down to 30 minutes. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Guys, pay attention. Why two thrones? I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, one who looked human, who had a human appearance, a human body. One like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. So this Son of Man came riding the clouds. He came to the Ancient of Days. Guys, count. 
Son of man coming to the ancient of days. Son of man is not the ancient of days. He flies on the clouds to meet the ancient of days in heaven. Son of man comes to the ancient of days on clouds. So when he comes to the ancient of days, they brought him near before him. And there was given him, the son of man, dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. Wow, that sounds familiar. Familiar? Serve him, the son of man. His dominion is an everlasting <clears throat> dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Whoa, that's why he saw two thrones. Two thrones, two persons. A throne for the Ancient of Days, a throne for the Son of Man. The Son of Man, with the Ancient of Days, rules forever. His kingdom is indestructible. It never ends. So with the Ancient of Days, he rules forever. And like the Ancient of Days, all nations serve the Son of Man. And both of them appear in visible form. The Ancient of Days appears with a white robe with white hair. That other one appears as a human being. And this is Old Testament. This is the book of Daniel. But now let's go back to Daniel 7, 27. So now why, Daniel, are you using El Yonin, plural, most highs? Because he already showed you in the chapter there are two who are the most high. The Ancient of Days and the Son of Man, both together are the most highs, the highest ones. That's why it's plural. Making sense? Stephen, I'm done right now anyway. God bless you. Making sense? Why is the word most high in Aramaic plural? Because this is in Aramaic. Elionin, most highs. Because earlier in the chapter he told you two thrones, two persons occupying two thrones, two persons appearing visibly, one called the Ancient of Days, looking like an elder, an older person with white hair and a white robe, the other appearing in human form, called the Son of Man, appearing as a man, riding the clouds. Together they sit on the thrones and rule forever, and their kingdom is indestructible. They rule forever and ever, and they are both worshipped by all the nations. That's why it's most highs, because it's more than one. Oh, so Jehovah, Son of Most High, and yet Jehovah is the Most High. The Most High has a son named Jehovah. But Jehovah is the Most High. And the Most High, who is his father, is also Jehovah. And we come to the New Testament, father and son. Both of them are the Most High. Both of them rule forever. And Jesus is the son of God, the son of the Most High. And his father, the Most High, gave him his inheritance. And then Jesus says, he is that son of man who comes with the clouds of heaven. Mark 14, 62. Mark 14, 62. And we're done. Mark 14, 62. Who is Jesus? We're done. And Jesus said, I am, and ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Wait, Jesus. You are that son of man who comes on the clouds of heaven that Daniel saw? Yeah. So you're not the Ancient of Days? No. You approach the Ancient of Days? Yes. And the Ancient of Days appeared to Daniel in visible form with a white robe and white hair? Yes. But who's that Ancient of Days, Jesus? That's my father. So wait, Jesus, you're telling me Daniel had a vision where he saw you visibly as a man riding the clouds? To your father, and he saw your father appear visibly. So God the Father appeared to Daniel with a white robe and white hair? Yeah. So Daniel saw both the father and the son visibly? Yes. Wow. I am blown away. That's it for this part. I went too long. Lord Jesus willing, if the Lord wills, I'm going to do a part two on this. And I'm going to do a video for my daughters, telling them how much we love them. and wishing my oldest a happy birthday. Pray I hear from them. Pray their mother's not playing games, that she's kept the phone away. Because I can see my last messages are not delivered. That means she's got the phone. Pray God will convict her to stop this. Because these kids need their father. She needs to stop this. May she repent. 
The Lord Jesus, remove Martin from their life. In Jesus' name, fight for them and me, Lord. And so, Lord willing, tomorrow I'm going to do part two. And then, God willing, Thursday, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to do a session showing the Holy Spirit is a person. Thursday, God willing, I'm going to do a session showing the Holy Spirit is a divine person and not a force. I need to do that because no one denies that God the Father is a person. No one denies that Jesus Christ is a person who also became man. But where people get confused is the Holy Spirit. Is he a person? So God willing, Thursday we will do, if the Lord wills, Holy Spirit is a person. And tomorrow, God willing, I'll do part two and wish my daughters a happy birthday. Please pray for them and us. Pray God miraculously saves me, gives me favor with the appellate courts to turn this corrupt judge's decisions against her to keep me safe. Pray for the provisions to do ministry, right? That God will continue to support through people like you. Pray God will keep me holy and pure. Keep my daughters and I healthy. Pray God will bring more people to this YouTube channel, more subscribers, more views. Study the material, study the articles, pass them on to others. Now, do you want my articles on Deuteronomy 32? So you guys didn't remind me. Want them? I hope these long two-hour sessions are not torturing you guys. Hold on. Here you go. Part one and two. Here goes, using Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 to 9, and Lord willing, we'll put in the description box. Here's part one, Deuteronomy 32, 8 to 9, to prove the Trinity, that Jehovah there is Jesus, the Son of the Father. So don't be scared of liberal scholarship. Liberal scholarship, take their arguments captive for the glory of Christ, Christianize their arguments, right, for the glory of Jesus Christ. I don't know if I did part two. I don't think I'm done with part two yet. Hold on. If there's a part two, it should be here. Oh, yeah, there's a part two. Sorry, I scared myself. So hope you guys were blessed. You were challenged. You were convicted. You were enlightened. You were stretched. The Lord willing, tomorrow I'll be on 5 p.m., between 5 and 6 p.m., Eastern Standard Time, Canadian Time, right, New York Time, if not a little earlier. Check my Facebook page. But pray for me, pray for my daughters. I miss them. Pray for a miracle, right? Tomorrow's their birthday, my firstborn, who made me a dad. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. He is the Son of the Most High, and He's God Almighty in the flesh, one with the Father and the Spirit. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, sooner than later, and keep us in love with you, and seal us and save us from Satan, the world, and from our own flesh to become more like you. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Take care.